And I'm going to show some things. I'm going to go through. I actually have a lot of slides, but I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, what's that? Let's pray. I agree with that. Father in heaven, we come to you today, and we just thank you for this time, and we thank you for this opportunity. We just open, uh, Lord, just pray you just open hearts and minds right now to hear your word for what it says. It's not metaphors and uh, similes and illustrations that, Lord, your word, you said exactly what you meant about how the earth is and how your universe is, and we believe that, God, and we thank you for it, and we just pray for your peace and your truth right now to go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me just go ahead and state this out front. When it comes to the Bible, it's without question a flat, non-rotating, geocentric earth. That's just the way it is. The only way the other side gets to make it a spinning, flying sphere is that they have to say, oh, those passages about the pillars of the earth and the foundation of the earth and the earth doesn't move, that that is just uh, metaphors. That's just poetry. But folks, I'm going to read this scripture here. We're going to read a few scriptures first to start off with. And this is 2 Peter 1, 16 through 20. You guys can put it on the screen for everybody. Let's read this. He says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is a, of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now here's the other scripture we're going to go through. All scripture, the 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture... Even the parts that they want to call metaphors and poetry, and I think Pastor Greg called one, he said hyperbole, but hyperbole means exaggeration and lies, and God doesn't do that. Uh, the Bible doesn't use those things. God means what he says. Now, there's, few, there's symbolic language. I'll say, like, for instance, let's, let's talk about a symbolic language. The Bible talks about a seven-head, ten-horned beast in the book of Revelation and in Daniel, right? But that seven-head, ten-horned beast we find out it's a literal thing. It's going to be a world government. In fact, the United Nations has already become that, a seven-head, ten-horned beast. You have the five on the permanent council. You have the P5 plus one, which is Germany, which six, and then the EU head comes in when they have a serious problem like the, the Iranian nuclear deal. So you have seven heads, and then under that, you have ten rotating positions. So literally, the UN that's going to end up being a world government has already seven heads and ten horns. So even though there's symbolic language at times in the Bible, it's talking about something that's real, okay? And that was what we need to agree on. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So the moment somebody says, well, the, what, what the Bible says in the book of Job or whatever about creation doesn't matter, no, it matters because it's profitable for doctrine, right? See, the thing about it is I'm not going to have to do theological jumping jacks to agree with the secular system about how the creation is. I can just stick with the Word of God, all right? Now, when he says here all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This one right here, Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, we are told, this is in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, that, that Satan would deceive the whole world. How is it that we think that Satan, who is invisible, who has power, who actually has people who serve him in the government, in the militaries of the world, how is it that we think if we gave him $60 million a day, which is NASA's budget, that he couldn't deceive the whole world with something? And we know from the Bible that the number one way we know there's a creator, and that leads us to a creator, it says that we're without excuse, is the creation. 
So if you were the devil and you wanted to lead people away from the Bible and finding Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you would need to twist the creation story to make it completely wrong and get people to believe that your version of it is right and the Bible's is wrong. All right? But that's exactly what Satan has done. Now, people, all the Christians, when they come up, they ask, well, why does this matter? Well, we're going to find out in just a second. But here's another verse. People don't talk about conspiracy. Look, there's conspiracy theories, and then there's conspiracy facts. Lord, when they tell you, like, for instance, they're going to make a vaccine, well, Bill Gates said this in 2010. He said, when they say, oh, yeah, we're going to lower the population of the world through new vaccines. Now, they just told you what they're going to do, but most people can't even believe that. But it's already been happening. Now, the Bible says there's going to be a massive plot, a massive conspiracy against the God of the Bible and his Messiah, Jesus Christ. We read it right here, Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens, though, shall laugh and shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So he tells us here that the evil, and this is the last day's context, he's going to talk about the Messiah coming and ruling with a rod of iron. Jesus is going to return and fix everything, right? But he tells us that the kings of the earth are going to take counsel, and actually the Amplified says they're going to bring together a plot. And yes, so they're all in on it. Every lie that's out there, folks, whether it be about creation, I mean, or, or whatever, every lie out there is to turn people away from the truth of God's word. You understand? That's what, that's what this is over. We can sit here and argue maps and models and I have my military experts and he has his. We can argue this stuff all day long. But the bottom line is the fruit, the fruit of what's going on. And does the Bible say it? But there is a plot. Now let me show you part of where that plot is. Let's go to Romans. Here we go to Romans. He says here, this is Romans 1, 18 through 20. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. Now this word in the Greek, hold, means to hold down, suppress, withhold. He says that there are men who withhold the truth because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So he tells us here that part of the plot, remember Acts, I mean, Psalm 2, we just read, part of the plot is this hiding the truth about creation, suppressing it. They know there's a firmament. They tried to blow it up in the 1960s with Operation Fishbowl. Glad it didn't work, right? Now let's keep going here. Oh, my bad, wrong one. Here we go. Now, this is what Pastor Greg said when his first rant here. He said, I don't care about biblical cosmology. There is no such thing. It's man-made. A few minutes later, he said, I want to be fair to that side because... We've been lied to in a bunch of other areas does not mean we've been lied to about the shape and cosmology of the earth. Well, is cosmology a thing or is it not a thing? I just wonder it. But cosmology is simply the definition. Cosmology is the science of the universe. Cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole from its origin. And, of course, they use the term evolution. We don't believe in evolution. But they, it's, it's about the origin of the universe. All right? This is what it's about. Now, the world system has their version of this. They believe in a big bang, that nothing exploded and created everything, right? Which that's, that's to me is mind-blowing, how they believe this. Um, but this is their thing. It's the next, let me see, did I do it right there? That one right there. So their big bang, look at it. They're at billions of years, these galaxies and stars and all this stuff. This is their version, but this is not God's version. Now, let me ask you a question. We, we would think it's ridiculous now. Um, like modern science. Modern science says that we evolved from the primordial goo and these creatures came along and then we finally became primates and then we finally, after millions and zillions of years, we, we evolved from primates or monkeys. Now, why as Christians do we not believe that? Number one, 
There is no evidence. If there was millions of years of this transitional phase, there would be skeletons and fossils of this transitional phase. So number one, there's no evidence that we can see. And the Bible clearly teaches that we didn't come from monkeys over millions and billions of years. Now, we don't believe the scientists. The scientists would get up here and tell you it's a fact that we came from monkeys. But we don't accept that. But then we're going to accept their version. You say, well, I've heard people say, well, I believe in the Big Bang. God made a Big Bang, and that's the way it was. No, no. He tells us exactly how he created the earth in Genesis, in Job, in Psalms. He tells us exactly how he did it. Um, and it's important. You say, well, why is it important? Well, let me show you something before we get to that. Let me show you what Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of our top astrophysicists, and Michio Kaku tell us. These are your scientists. There is a crisis in cosmology. Usually in science, if we're off by a factor of two or a factor of ten, we call that horrible. We say something's wrong with the theory. We're off by a factor of ten. However, in cosmology, we're off by a factor of ten to the one hundred and twenty. That is one with a hundred and twenty zeros after it. This is the largest mismatch between theory and experiment in the history of science. Dark matter. I get asked what it is, and my best answer is, we haven't a clue. <laughs> we don't know what it is. We look out in the universe, and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste, and it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really, we should be calling it the dark force because we don't know if it's made of matter like it could be a profound misnomer sending people off in thought directions that might not really be uh, the right path so dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing responsible for 85 percent of the gravity of the cosmos we've known about dark matter since the 1930s back then it was called missing mass that's what it was called because yeah there's got to be some mass where is it we can't find it it's got to be here somewhere because we got the gravity. If you have the gravity, you got to have the mass. Mass and gravity go together. Uh, it's really dark gravity. Actually, we shouldn't call it anything. We should call it Fred. <laughs> Something that has no meaning because we don't know what it is to call it. But it has been a, it is the longest standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Now here's two of your top scientists in the world telling you that on cosmology, they're off by 10 with 120 zeros beside it. Then they start telling you for our model to work, this all this gravity nonsense and spinning and flying things, they said, it's got to have a certain amount of gravity, but we don't know, it doesn't have that. Our, what they're saying is that, that our whole system we've built makes no sense to us, it doesn't work. And I'll tell you why they call it missing mass. The missing mass is called the firmament, you're going to see that in a second. That's what they miscalculate. But I want to share you with you this here, and we're going to skip ahead here. I've already talked about this. This is what is called the Hebrew concept of the universe. This is what the Bible teaches. All right? And we'll get back to this in just a second, but it shows you that this is what the firmament is the dome structure over the flat, non rotating earth. Hell is beneath, heaven is above that. God's throne sits on that. This is what the Bible teaches. There's all of the scriptures around that. We're going to get to that in a second. So. More like that, not that. In fact, that sphere you're looking at there is a, <laughs> it's a composite image. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible describes a solid firmament dome covered to flat earth on set on pillars on a foundation that God himself built. Nothing in the Bible describes the earth as a sphere. All right, and I'm going to show you that and I'm going to prove that. But many Christians ask, why does it matter or just say the issue of the nature of creation doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you why it matters. And you're going to see this. Now, before we get to that, I want you to see Jesus said this. This is Matthew 24. This is Jesus talking. These are in your red letters here. Jesus said that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven. He didn't say meteorites, comets. He said the stars. 
It's the same word he used throughout the Bible for the stars. Now, either they're stars or they're not stars. Now, the heliocentric Copernican model that you guys, some of you want to believe in, says that the stars out there are bigger, are, are massive, bigger than the earth. They're, they're huge things. That If one fell to the earth, it would swallow the earth. So Jesus did not teach a Copernican cosmology. He taught a biblical cosmology and that the stars are smaller, closer, and are going to fall to the earth. Now that's Jesus in the Bible. And if you say that it's not the stars, it's some meteorites or comets or whatever, you're making up stuff because you are filtering that through a bias you've been brainwashed with from birth. All right? The Bible says the stars. Now, I was talking to a person who was a science teacher who's a, a strong Christian, and I said, I said, what about the stars falling to the earth? And he goes to, to Revelation 6, and he says, well, don't you think that's just what, what John was seeing was asteroids and meteorites falling? It wasn't really stars. And I said, well, I said, you got a problem with that if you're going to say it's just asteroids and meteorites because Jesus said it was stars. So did Jesus know what he was talking about or not? So here's a place that seriously the Bible does not agree with the cosmology of this world system, NASA and everybody else. And what's amazing to me, let me just say this, what's amazing to me is that Christians have tried to mix the world system cosmology into Christianity and they don't work. You can't do it. And this is proof of that right here and I'm going to show you what the atheists do. Now let's listen to this. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson again, one of your top astrophysicists, astronomers, and here's what he says about this issue of the stars, the Bible saying the stars fall in. People who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature. That's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So it's even right that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. I have known serious religious people, not fundamentalists, who were scared when Carl Sagan opened his series with the words, The cosmos is all that is or ever was 
or ever will be. But that scared them because they interpret that to mean then if this is it, there's nothing else. No God and no life after. For, for religious people, many people say, well, God is within you. Or yeah. God, there are ways that people have shaped this rather than God is an old gray-bearded man in the clouds. So if God is within you, what I'm sure Carl would say, in you, in your mind. In your mind, and we can measure the neurosynaptic. Okay, now we're going to move on from here. But you understand, see, you say, why does it matter? Because people have believed this instead of believing what God's word said, and many people have fallen away. They've walked away. People have said, I'm, I'm not following God anymore. I'm not even Christian. I, I watched a thing this, this week where even many Bible scholars are departing because they accept science as God. It's like it's infallible instead of trusting God's word. Let me tell you, this world is full of lies, folks. I believe they've lied about everything. I believe they've lied about the sun, moon, stars, the whole thing. I can tell you this much, I don't care how many people you brought in here, I'm going to stand with what Jesus said and the way he described it. And what's beautiful about it is every now and then he gives us the ability to prove it. And um, I have Joe Hanvey here, we may call him up, but Joe Hanvey has is is been doing some amazing experiments in photography. He has actually photographed the nebula with the stars in front of them with a with a shadow behind the stars on the nebula, showing you it's not what you've been told. Matter of fact, NASA artists do most of what you, what you think is space and planets and all this stuff is NASA artistry, and I have them admitting it. Disney, guy worked for Disney, now works for NASA. I'm going to skip this atheist right here. We're gonna... Now, I'm, I'm talking about how science can impact. Here's a story of how science can impact young Christians. And boy, we, do we have young Christians falling away from God left and right. And one of the reasons is they go to school, they go to college, and they start getting taught this stuff that it's not the way that the that creation is not the way God says, it's not the way the Bible says it. And they fall away. And some, it's even worse than that, they commit suicide. Jesse Kilgore, community college student in New York, took his own life when he was just 22 years old. He was raised in a devout evangelical Christian Household was a firm believer of Christianity until he took a biology class in college, which led him to experiencing a crisis of faith. The biology professor also recommended Jesse to read The God Delusion, a book by, written by atheist Richard Dawkins, uh, an atheist biologist. As a result, reading his book and taking the biology class, he learned a lot of things which challenged and contradicted his own beliefs, which caused him to abandon his faith and ultimately take his own life. Um, this is it's sad, but it's true. And this is where we are. You could, I could give a lot of examples of this. There's more studies, but it says right here in a, a research study on the impacts of science and the discontinuation of faith and practice in Christianity in young adults, in their observations, and this is the Center for Science and Culture did this study, they noted that 59 to 70 percent of students growing up with a Christian background will likely lose their faith or abandon their religion by the time they reach college. An example of someone who contributes to this statistic is Kyle Simpson, who had a similar story to Jesse. Like, like Jesse, Kyle was raised a Christian, but science changed his mind and beliefs when he was in his 20s. Although he did not take his own life like Jesse, Kyle decided to discontinue his faith in Christianity. So you're going to tell me it doesn't matter. Now, I want to say this tonight. I want to say hey to our atheist friends. One of the reasons I'm going down this road is because uh, here we have Owen Morgan who has about 400,000 followers, another guy, the friendly atheist who has about 100,000. They're all talking about they're going to watch this tonight. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, I'm going to show you some fruit that when people have seen the evidence for a flat, geocentric, non-rotating earth, that many atheists have seen the evidence and come to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They've come back to the faith. And I just want to say hey to them, and I appreciate them sharing on their channels that we were having this debate, and now they're laughing it up. But I want to tell you what they don't realize. They're losing a lot of their atheist friends over what we can show them. They're coming to Jesus. Now, let me share with you. Let's go to this, this right here. Now, I want to say, I'm, I put this up because I want everybody to hear them, but I'm going to read this. 
So many atheists have come to know God. They've come back to the Bible. They've come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they didn't do it because all of a sudden they just started believing the Bible out of the blue. Or somebody showed them something, another, another lie or another trick or another, you know, another fairy tale. I said, many atheists and scientists think that those of us who believe in a geocentric, stationary, flat earth only came to this belief via our religion or crackpot YouTube videos. But that is not the case. It was seeing the evidence of real experiments, doing the math, making our own conclusions from our own observations about the nature of our world that brought most of us to this understanding of creation. For 99% of us, it was after seeing the evidences that we all realized what the Bible taught, that the Bible taught these truths all along. And it is that journey of examining the evidences that show we do actually live on a geocentric, stationary, flat earth that has brought many atheist agnostics to faith in the Bible and thus finding God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, as their creator and personal savior. Now I want to show you we're not afraid of science. We actually go out with high zoom cameras and telescopes and lasers and actually do test in different climate, time, you know, in different uh, weather and different conditions to see what we can prove. And I'm going to show you some of that in a minute. But I want to, here's a testimony that this is Paul Logberg from Sweden. He was raised an atheist, uh, became a mechanical engineer and began looking into some conspiracies and, and came across Flat Earth and he laughed at it. And then, well, you'll hear his story. It's only two minutes. I was an atheist 39 years, have gone, gone through universities, um, schooling, everything, um, never had really an interest in God, uh, never really was a God hater, but of course I had other issues like idols and stuff, and like all uh, atheists have. In Sweden, basically all uh, people are atheists, 80% atheists, 15% Muslims nowadays, and... Um, whatever, 5% others. I was uh, one of the atheists, of course, like all. Um, 2011, I started investigating what is wrong with the world. Why is the world going absolutely crazy? Land that flat earth around 2015, yes, April 2015, just laughed it off. You know, okay, this is just completely crazy. But after a month, I looked into it anyway and uh, thought oh, I'll get a good laugh. Well, no, I, I saw it right. Okay, there's no way that it's a ball. Um, and then I got interested in what does the Bible actually say? Oh, if, if it was right about that already from the start, maybe it's right about the other parts also regarding the endings. Turned out, yes, it was. Gave my life to Christ in uh, 2016. And, uh, yeah, uh, didn't look back. Um, the world is just so filled with lies, it's uh, actually quite sickening and disturbing. But uh, we have one hope, that's Jesus and His Word, and I'm grateful for it. I uh, hope this helps someone. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Now, I love this. Paul flew in 2017, all six foot seven of him, flew all the way from Sweden because he wanted a pastor that believed the Bible to baptize him in water. Amen. But he's not the only one. This is Soren from Denmark. He actually heads up the Denodal Europe page now, but he was a complete atheist. I want you to hear his story. How you guys doing? My name is Soren. I'm from Denmark. I used to be an atheist up until 2015 when I mockingly began researching Flat Earth. And when I had researched that for about a year and a half, I came to the realization that we've been lied to, that the Earth was in fact a flat stationary plane and not a spinning water ball. That opened up the possibility of a creator, which in turn shattered my atheism. And while I was researching that creator, I came across videos from Pastor Dean and the late Rob Skiba. And as I was watching them, they were talking about creation, biblical creation, which matched perfectly the research I've been doing and thousands of others uh, on the true shape and nature of creation. So my trust in the Bible was restored where I before didn't have any faith why I trust the Bible when you couldn't even trust page one. Now I could trust page one. 
And as I continued listening to these guys, their sermons, I began to understand sin and I understood the gospel and why Jesus had to come and die on the cross for us, which led me to true repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And now I am a born again, spirit filled disciple of Jesus. Praise be to God. So I'm forever thankful that truth in truth sets people free. And I'm forever grateful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Love from Denmark. Hallelujah. I'm sure Soren's watching right now. One more before we move on from this. This is Chelsea. She's actually here tonight. And God's done a great um, thing. I was a staunch atheist for about 15 years. And it was a dark and despairing worldview that I wouldn't wish on anyone. But it always left me wondering what's the point. I found this little corner of hope and mystery and the possibility of life out there. And I could fill a library with all the science fiction that I read over the years, trying to fill the void of atheism. Enter COVID, and like so many others, I ask myself, what else are they lying about? And it turns out the answer is everything. And it turns out the world is run by a bunch of Satan-loving liars who have us so bamboozled that we don't even know where we are. And it turns out that we've been living in their science fiction. You see, when you tell a story that begins with something exploding out of nothing, out of a gajillion years and a whole lot of chance, you don't need God for that story to make sense. In fact, you have to do some disingenuous gymnastics to write God into that story. But if you see that we're really living in something like a cosmic terrarium, you can't avoid the conclusion that we're in somebody's terrarium. Try to write God out of that story, I dare you. It was only a few short steps for me from the mind-blowing realization of the flat earth to the God of the Bible. I thought, okay, there really isn't any evidence to support the heliocentric globe model, short of CGI, but why would they construct a lie at that scale, and how? The biblical worldview is the only worldview that can truly make sense of that level of deception. The level of deception that has fooled multiple generations into believing that we're on a spinning water ball in a vacuum when everything in our experience screams the opposite. That level of deception demands that we confront the existence of evil because that's what their science fiction is and that's its purpose. People ask me, what does it matter what shape the earth is? Well, the truth always matters. No lie is benign. But I'd ask them, would they construct such a massive lie for no reason? No way. This massive lie has an equally massive purpose from beginning to end. It's the very foundation of the scientific worldview that aims to make God irrelevant. And I'd bet the farm that it plays a critical role in the great deception in the times ahead. In my experience, had I not come to the truth of creation, I can't imagine what else would have not only shaken me from my atheism, but also brought me to the truth of God's word. I'd heard the gospel, I grew up in the Bible Belt, but I could not reconcile that worldview with the one that I'd already implicitly accepted which told me that the world is a meaningless accident. I had to first understand that the very foundation of their supposedly scientific creation story is a lie before I could come to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, I think the inherent cynicism of the heliocentric universe that exploded from nothing is fundamentally incompatible with the gospel of Jesus. Do you really think that our creator, who's so personal that he offered himself as a sacrifice so that we may be redeemed, matches up with some behind-the-scenes intelligent designer who had a veiled hand behind a big bang that created an ever-expanding universe where there's no such thing as up or down. I don't. I believe we are very carefully, intentionally, and lovingly placed in a world that is not just some random piece of a vast creation, but it's the very heart of creation itself. I believe that he is not in heaven we vaguely imagine as somewhere else, but that he, his throne is just right above us. He is invested in us. That much the Bible makes clear. And so I pray that you reject the lie that would have you believe otherwise. Now, literally, in my book, Like Clay Under the Seal, I have one chapter dedicated to atheists come to Jesus. And it's testimony after testimony. And I, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them all here. But you see... 
I could do this. I could do this for two hours on atheists that have come to Jesus because of understanding and seeing the evidence for a flat, stationary, geocentric, non-rotating flat Earth, as our government documents want to say. Um, I'm, I'm going to speed through this. I want to. I want to say this. These are reasons people that be, that people believe that we live on a spinning ball or sphere orbiting the sun in an ever-expanding universe. These are really the main reasons. The boats disappearing from the bottom up. We can say that doesn't happen. Pictures from space, we found out that that's a lot of fakery. Fisheye lens photography that creates a fake curve all the time. The alleged shadow of the Earth on the moon's surface during the lunar eclipse, that's easy to deal with. Foucault's pendulum, I mentioned that earlier. Erastinophanes, who probably didn't even exist, but his experiment works on a flat plane with a closed sun exactly, so there's no sense in that. Uh, using that as an argument. Circumnavigation, you can go around your neighborhood or you can go around a sphere. You can do it either way and end up in, back in the same place. Um, and satellites and GPS, I have a great deal about what those are from not only uh, declassified government documents, but just available documents. And of course, grandiose scientific explanations. Now, I'm just going to show you this. Of course, we've all seen this. If the boat went over a curve, there'd be no way to bring it back. But as you see when you zoom in, the boat's there. Now, if it's over a curve, you can't see it. Nothing would enable you to see that boat. But it, I don't care how powerful your zoom, but when you zoom in, it's the, the horizon's empty, and you zoom in, and the boat's there. They're not disappearing over a curve. They're just getting out of our ability to see it. So that is another mistake. Here's the video I showed you about perspective. There's a guy walking away, and you notice that his feet are disappearing. And it goes up to his knees, and then up to his waist. He's walking on a flat football field, but he's disappearing from the bottom. You know the other grass I said, all these people say, oh, you want to know how to turn and watch the boat go over the horizon. I mean, they still say this, and, it, and, and I can't believe that they don't know this. And of course, here's, uh, so you're telling me you can drag that ship back over the curve with that, that little telescope there. Now, I don't have time to go through. I'm going to just run through these very quickly, but we know that we've caught them photoshopping clouds and stuff. They create these images of Earth. They're not real pictures. Uh, even the guy who did the blue marble says it's photoshopped because it has to be. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, NASA artists do the pictures of the world. So this Oops. is just insane. And this is sort of how it... Here's, here's two pictures they tell us are from space of the Earth. I want you all to look at North America. Which one is correct? Because the one, the one there, the big one, seems like North America has taken up a big section of the ball there, much bigger than it really is. So we, we get these kind of things, and they want us to trust them, but it's just impossible. Um, here's where they faked the, uh, you know, the big picture we had for years was Apollo 17. And Apollo 17, they said, you know, they're at the moon 240,000 miles away, and they can see the whole Earth. But look, they only got a picture of that little circle there. The, they didn't get the whole lit side of the Earth. So it proves that they weren't high enough to get it, that they faked it. Um, Finally, the element that seals their fate. And this is where they faked it. Oh. I'm not even going to play it. You can go this, go watch a funny thing happen on the way to the moon, Bart Sabrell. He shows the picture footage. How many of you want to see it? Y'all want to see it real quick? All right, I'll back up and show you. Just so you know you can't trust them. Here we go. I'll play it. Finally, the element that seals their fate. Of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the Earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. 
It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be a... Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, dear. We just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in from the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window under it, any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is, in reality, in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Hi, Roger. Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. All right, I'm going to end that. You, you guys see, we can't, this is why we can't trust their pictures. Finally. But I'm going to go on, I want to go through all this. I could go through all the fakery. They were using fisheye lenses in, all the way in the 60s. I need to get to the Bible stuff. I can, I can give you this proof all day long right here, what things really are. High altitude balloons, that's what satellites are. We're going to go down through all of this stuff. I'm going to go. 
Uh, they, that's what they say is out there. You never see those satellites and debris out there, though, in the ISS flyover feeds. But here we go. Let's, let's get to this. Y'all see I had a lot of slides. There's long distance photography of Chicago, 60 miles. You shouldn't be able to see any of it. All right. I, I can't do it all. I'm getting to the Bible because I know we're, we're out of time. All of this stuff's on my website, folks. The, seven, the Sevenfold Doctrine of Creation series. This is our own test. I can show you. We, did, we saw Spool sitting on the dock at 11 miles away. That's my film right there at 11 miles away. S Spool sitting on the dock. Uh, this earth's not curved. I can tell you that right now. You can go with us and we can show you. See, let me zoom out. At 11 miles, there should be a seven-story building bulge blocking my view of what's sitting on the dock in the Alabama state docks there. Now, let's keep going. I've done shots. We've catch cars going across bridges at 13, 14 miles away. We know the height of them and everything. So we've done our own experiments. And we've had PhDs in physics. We've had engineers. We've had Army officers. Just let you see, I'm going through them quick here. I'm going to get to the Bible stuff. I had 244 slides, y'all. Scientists proved that, that Kansas is flatter than a pancake all the way across. All right, let's go here. We're, we're to the Bible. Let me do this. All right, so we go back to the Genesis. Let's just, I'm going to go through the Bible as quickly as I can on this stuff. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form of void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I want you to notice something. He uses the term here, first of all, the waters. One thing we know about water, it always finds its level. We use levels to build buildings and to keep them level. And the term face is a term, is a geometry term, it's a math term. And to use the term face of the earth and face of the waters is used multiple times, many times in the Bible. And what does a face mean? An individual flat surface of a solid object. But even if you want to argue that, I can tell you that you look at, and you go out and you see like a pond or a lake and you see this perfect reflection upon it. That perfect reflection, that mirror reflection that you're seeing cannot happen on a curved surface, only on a flat one. Uh, let's keep going here. Here's the key though. Here's, the, here's what, what most ministers and even so-called creation ministries get wrong is this issue is what is the firmament? What does the Bible teach about it? God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. I'm going to break this down as fast as I can for you. He talks about the open firmament of heaven, our atmosphere where the birds fly. The Bible teaches that the firmament that he's talking about here that he calls heaven is a solid crystalline structure that supports waters above it. That is called heaven, and then there is the third heaven where the throne of God is. All right, that's your three heavens, not some outer space, not some expanse. In fact, the most disingenuous and the most dishonest definition of this word is to call it some empty expanse. That is not how it's defined. That is not how Moses and Joshua and everyone believed what it was, even Josephus. I want to show you that. We've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible. When we talk about what is the firmament, right, we know that God said here, Genesis uh, 1, 6, 7, about the firmament divided the waters from the waters. The flood happened here, and it says that there were three things. In 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, that's one, and the windows of heaven were open, that's two. And God remembered Noah, and this was at the end of the flood, and all the cattle that was with him, and God made wind to pass over the earth, and the waters were assuaged. For the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain. So you had the fountains of the deep, the windows of heaven, which opened to let that water in that was from above, and then you also had rain. Anybody that says it was just rain is not being honest with the scriptures. It's that fact. We had three sources of water at the flood. What Christians believe for many years was a thing called the canopy theory. Dr. Carl Ball taught it and others taught it where they said that, that the firmament was a vapor canopy that was around the earth that condensed and then flooded the earth and thus doing away with the firmament. 
The problem with that is the Bible proves that wrong, that the firmament collapsed as a canopy because 1,350 years after the flood, the Holy Spirit moved on David to say, Praise him, ye heavens, and ye waters that be above the heaven. Let them praise his name, or praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He hath established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. So anybody that says that the firmament or this was condensed vapor canopy that disappeared is not true. We have 1,350 years later, he's telling us the waters are still above the heavens. The Hebrew word for firmament is the Hebrew word rakia. It has a root word. Almost all Hebrew words have a three-letter root word. So you have rakia is the word for firmament, and the root word is raka. All right? Here's the definition of these words according to not only what the Hebrew meant, but also what they believed. So we have to see how God uses it. But firmament rakia does not mean an empty expanse. Anybody who tells you that the firmament or rakia means empty expanse, like, uh, like Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answers in Genesis, he will say it's an empty expanse, that the firmament is outer space. He is not being true to the definition of the Hebrew word. Literally, it says it is an expansion of plates, broad plates beaten out. So it's literally, the word means taking something that's solid and beating it into a shape. Okay? That's the definition of the word. Uh, the verb raka acquires the sense of beating out precious metals, spreading that out, and results to spread over or to overlay. All right? He goes on here. Of course, this is the Brown Driver Briggs. It says... Uh, extended surface, solid, expanse as beaten out. Not an empty expanse, but expanding something that's solid over something. That's the picture of this word. And the Hebrews, the ancient Israelites, believed that it was solid, the firmament was a solid structure, and called it the vault of heaven. So here's your definition, the vault of heaven or firmament regarded by the Hebrews as solid and supporting the waters above. This is what all of the ancient Jews believed because they believed the Bible. Amen? They believed it about the firmament. Here is another lexicon, Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, defines Rakia like this. The firmament of heaven spread out like a hemisphere above the earth, like a splendid, pellucid, translucently clear, transparent, crystalline, glassy, allowing the maximum passage of light, as glass, sapphire, stone, to which the stars were supposed to be fixed and over which the Hebrews believed that there was a heavenly ocean. Now this is another lexicon, defining it as they believed it, as the Bible spells it out, not as new Copernican Christians want to believe it is to be. Now let's keep going. It says, additionally, Hebrew scholars believe, again, when they translated, you know, in 250 B.C., they translated the Hebrew Old Testament into, uh, from Hebrew to Greek. That was called the Septuagint version, around 250 B.C. When they translated the word firmament, they used the word stereoma, all right? And when they used the word stereoma, that is known word, Thayer's Greek lexicon defines stereoma, that which has been made firm, the firmament, the arch of the sky, which in early times was thought to be solid, a fortified place. Do you hear that? So the word they translated. So you're going to tell me Hebrew scholars translating the Bible from Hebrew and the Greek scholars translating it to make it. They just decided, no, we, we should pick a, a thin vapor or some kind of gas. No, they said something that's firm, that's solid. Again, this is what the scriptures teach. Now let's keep going because there's more. Here's the, uh, it says uh, uh, a ex strong extended surface, expanse beat. Now, just showing you that it's, it's multiple lexicons. Now, here's Job 37, 18. Now, this is going to show you, you know, this may not be technically God speaking, but this is one of, of the wise men of the East that were Job's friends. And this is what they believed. This is showing you what he believed. He said to Job, has thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass? So what this proves, you can say, well, that wasn't God talking, but this is what they believed. And that, why did they believe it? Because they believed the Bible. They believed what God had already revealed to them. But let's keep going here. Is it that way? Now, the Hebrew word for spread out there is raka. Now, here's the definition of raka, and you need to, you, we're going to come back to this in a minute. 
The definition of raka means to pound the earth or as a sign of passion, to expand by hammering, by implication to overlay with sheets of metal, to make broad, to spread abroad into place, to stamp. Oh, somebody say stamp. Or like a seal, press down. This is what a stamp is. He says this, that's what this word rock is. Now let's look at the, the ancient uh, Josephus, the historian. Now many believe that Josephus was also of a priestly line, that he was a priest and a Pharisee. So he was well acquainted with what the Jews believed about creation. And this is what he said about the firmament. He said, and this is in book one entitled The Constitution of the World and the Deposition, Disposition of the Elements. Josephus, the first born in the first century but crossed over into the second century. He said, after this, on the second day, he, God, placed the heaven over the whole world, separated it from other parts, and he determined that it should stand by itself. So he's talking about the firmament here, that God placed it over the whole earth and that it stands by itself. In fact, in architecture, an arch is the strongest structure that you can build. And it also must be strong because it supports a lot of water. And he says here, that he placed this firmament, the crystalline, notice he says crystal, crystalline firmament, round it and together in agreement and agreeable to the earth and fitted it for the giving of moisture and rain and for the affording advantages of dews. On the fourth day he adorned the heaven with the sun, moon, and the stars and appointed them their courses. So this right here, Josephus is teaching a true biblical Hebrew cosmology because as God placed a firmament over the earth, he says the sun, moon, and stars are in that firmament and they all move in a circuit. So he's teaching the sun moves, the moon moves, the earth moves, not, I mean the, the stars, sun, and the moon, but not the earth. You understand? This is what the Jews taught and believed. All right? Now let's keep going. Does the Bible say more about this? And then basically God made a terrarium. This is the longest lasting terrarium in the world. You put the right things in a terrarium, guess what? Things flourish. They live forever. It's a beautiful structure that God made. Now let's go to this. We need confirmation. We'll go to the firmament. Is it crystal? What is it? So Ezekiel's talking about it in Ezekiel chapter 1. And he says, The likeness of the firmament upon their heads of the living creatures was as the color. The King James used a color, but the definition of that word is the appearance of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads, and when they stood and they had let down their wings, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness and appearance of a man above it. So Ezekiel in his vision, he is seeing this firmament over their heads, and he said the appearance of it is like a terrible crystal, and he says, and I see the throne of God sitting upon it, and I see this, this, this image of a man upon it. So the Bible says God's throne sits upon this firmament that's solid, and it's like a sea of glass. I wonder where that's in the Bible. He keep, we keep on. Revelation 4 says, After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. He said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne, and he that sat upon the throne was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight of an emerald. And the throne, and before the throne, there was a sea of crystal, a sea of glass like unto crystal. This is what the Bible said. That before the throne is like a sea of glass that's like crystal, and God's throne is seated upon it. And it's interesting, he says, that there is an emerald rainbow or light emanating from that, and I wonder what that might be. But of course, the scientists say, that's uh, electromagnetic radius, radiation from the sun. Right, you know what I believe it is? The glory of God coming into the earth. Shining through the crystalline dome that he sits upon. Revelation 15 also refers to the sea of glass at the throne of God. He says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, and for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Well, guess what? One of the ways you make glass is melting sand by, with fire. 
And he says, I, he says, now listen to this. He said, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God in their hands. <laughs> Folks, Benny Hinn the other day said heaven was a, was a planet, another planet out there. That is the biggest bunch of nonsense I ever heard in my life. It's right above us. God's throne sits upon it, and he looks at us like grasshoppers through his firmament dome. This was uh, Amos 9, 6, of course, the, he, the, you know, the King James, I love my King James Bible, but sometimes they did not translate w words, pick the right words correctly. I know some people, I think that they were perfect translators, they were not. This in the Amplified, you actually have to look up every word in the Hebrew in this verse to even understand what it's talking about. But listen to this. This is Amplified version of 9.6. It is he, speaking of God, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and has established his vaulted dome, the firmament of heaven, over the earth. He who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. So here's another scripture that gives you an idea of the firmament. Now, here we are. The Bible teaches a circular flat earth, the North Pole, the magnetic center, the Antarctica, the ice walls. We've talked about that the earth is stationary. Now, this is what the Bible says with a molten dome over it. Now, let's keep going through the scriptures. Now, any way you go from there south, we could talk about this all day long. They say there's not an ice wall, but there it is. Antarctica is the ice wall boundary around the oceans. I've got a whole sermon. It's like two hours long on just... Antarctica and the ends of the earth. There it is, Job 26.10. He's compassed the waters with bounds until night and day come to an end. He's inscribed a circular limit. Right? It's not <laughs> on the face of the waters. I mean, you just keep going. He has fixed a circle on the surface of the waters. And on and on. There's even declassified documents that says most of the coast of Antarctica are covered by great depths of snow and ice extends seaward. Beyond the shoreline terminate with vertical cliffs approaching 200 feet in height. So we want to say the wall's not there, but it is. Now, language is important. Language is important. A circle is not a ball. Okay? And God's word makes this very clear here that a circle is not a ball. In Isaiah 42, we're going to read that in a minute, it says it's he that sits upon the circle of the earth. There are people, Christians, that are still saying that that means the earth's a sphere. It never says sphere. The definition, this word is kug, and it means a circle. And it talks about in Proverbs, he inscribed a circle upon the face of the deep, not a sphere. In another place, in Isaiah 22, 18, he uses the term that King James translates ball. It is the word dir. So there's two different words in the Bible, Hebrew, the original Hebrew, for circle and ball, kug and dir. And God never uses dir, which means a sphere, to describe the earth. Never, never, never. All right? Here it is, you look it up, a circle, a circuit, a compass. This is the, the Strong's definitions. Circle, Proverbs 8, here's the word dir. Just show you, look it up, it says ball, pile, something that has shape to it, like that. All right, two different words for circle and ball. Never used, here it is, this is Proverbs says, when he established the heaven, wisdom, I wisdom was there. When he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the fountains and springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set the sea its boundary so that the waters would not transgress the boundaries by his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So he's talking about God drew a circle. Let me tell you, I built my own fire pit back when I turned 50. I'm, I'm about to turn 56. I don't know if I can still do it, but I, I, you know what I did? I wanted a perfect circle because I wanted to build a four-foot diameter fire pit out of the, we have stones on our property. So what I did was I took a stake and drove it in the ground. I took a chain, ran it down the stake, and I took another one out here two feet, and I inscribed me a circle, and then I started building my outer wall. I just didn't put a firmament on it because I wanted to cook stuff in it. Amen? Now, this is, again, what God describes. Let's keep going. Now, let's go back to that. When he says he's made 
the sky strong like a molten looking glass. Now let's go back. Now let's go to look at Isaiah 40, 21 and 22. He says, have you not known, have you not heard, has it not been told you from the beginning, have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle, kub, not dir, circle, not ball, of the earth. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So when he's talking about spreading out the heavens, he's talking about when he spread out the firmament over the earth. Notice he said, like a tent. Nike tent, not a ball. You all see the difference? I ain't never been in a spherical tent in my life camping. And God said he made the earth like a tent. And here we are in a tent. Is the floor curved? No. God said, this, you want to know what the earth looks like? It's like a tent. Just like a tent. And the word for tent, of course, here's... What an old tent like Abraham and Sarah would have been in. Flat ground spread out over them for a place to dwell in. The word for tent here in the Hebrew is ohel. And it means tent, right? But I'm going to show you something. Let's, let's go to, this is Psalm 19. Now Psalm 19, I'm, I couldn't start out with the beginning, but this talks about how the firmament shows the handiwork of the Lord. All right? So the context of this, he starts out talking about the firmament. And then he says this. He says, their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them, talking about in the world, our world he made for us, he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Guess what the word tabernacle is here? It is the Hebrew word ohel, which means a tent. Meaning that the sun is in the tent. Amen. Then he goes on to talk about the sun. He says, he set a tabernacle, a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from one end of the heaven of the firmament to the other and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The Bible word here for circuit, guess what it is? Coog. <laughs> It's a circle. A circuit means to move in a circular path. So what we believe and what we see, what the Bible teaches, what Joshua was saying it was happening was the sun was moving in its circular path. Now get this. This is, this is what will blow your mind. Notice it says that nothing will, t will, will escape the heat of our sun. Nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. Guess what? Look up nothing in the Hebrew and it means nothing. So let me ask you a question. If, if nothing that God made can escape, escape the heat of our sun, how are there galaxies millions and millions of light years away? The Bible says the sun is in the tent, inside the firmament, closer to us, smaller, moving in a circular path, and that nothing that God made for us escapes the heat of it. So y'all got to deal with that one right there big time. Here's another one. There it is, an example of it in the tent. Now, is there evidence to show that the sun is inside the tent, inside the firmament, closer to us, smaller? We have it every day. You, you, you're going to start watching. Some of you who are skeptics that don't believe this, you're going to walk outside one day and you're going to see this. You're going to see it with the sun. You're going to see it with the moon. But you're going to see the clouds behind the sun and the moon. You're going to see this. I have photographed this. If the sun is 93 million miles away, there's no way there should ever be a cloud behind it. Not ever. And notice that Job said there in 37.21, Now men see not the bright light or the sun that in the clouds which the wind passes away. He's trying to tell us where is the bright light he made. The great, the great light. Where is it? In here with the clouds. And sometimes we catch the clouds behind the sun. Even photographers who aren't trying to catch it. Look at that. And then somebody wants to say, oh, is this the sun so bright? It's just an illusion. And then somebody puts a negative filter on it and proves it right there. Clouds are in front and behind. I'll tell you something else about a sun 93 million miles away. Let me tell you, there's more. It doesn't make hot spots. 
If that sun is 93 million miles, this is a high altitude balloon that reached 110,000 feet. If that sun is 93 million miles away, how is there a hot spot directly under it? There should be even light across those clouds. This could happen over and over again. Look at the hot spot there above it. This is just a photographer who's not even a flat earther. The hot spot above the, the, the clouds right there. If that sun is 93 million miles away, the light ray should be coming in evenly, and there's no way there should be hot spots. You might get refraction. You might say, oh, the light rays are refracted, but wait a minute now. That's a hot spot, meaning that, that's close to it. It's just like anybody that knows lighting in theater knows that you got to deal with hot spots, meaning where the light's right on it, right? I could do this all day long, but there's evidence, and this is why atheists are, have come to Jesus, because of this kind of evidence. The sun is not... 93 million miles away. It's just not. Like these are pictures for people who are not flat earth, biblical cosmology believers. I could do it all day long. Look at that. It happens with the moon too, regularly. In fact, this Reddit post, this is a person saying, I went out and saw the moon and it looks like there's clouds behind it. There's no, how is that possible? And people were like, it's just an illusion. You're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. That's, their, that's an excuse they have. It's not, you're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. Look at there. Clouds in front and behind the moon. I have photographed this myself. Now let's move on to this. The Bible is very clear about this, you know, you want to believe we're on a spinning, flying water ball. Now, as you call yourself a Christian, you've got to deal with these verses right here. And this verse, we're going to start with a few of them here. But it's pretty clear, Zechariah 1.11, and here's what it says. And the, the, the angel that was talking with Zechariah answered and said, and, he said and, the angel answered of the, and they answered the angel of the Lord among the myrtle trees, says, we have walked to and fro through the earth. These are these entities that have gotten permission. And they said, behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Somebody say, all the earth sitteth still. And is at rest. How is it wobbling, spinning, flying, and in danger of asteroids hitting it? Some people say, oh, that's just talking about the people of the earth. No, he said, the earth sitteth still and is at rest. And guess what? I looked these words up in the Hebrew. Guess what it means? Sit still. At rest. Not moving. In fact, the word in the Hebrew... Actually, Yashob here means to sit down, especially as a judge or sitting in ambush in quiet. All right? Now, this is what this is. So you're, if, if you're going to say, no, I believe the earth is spinning and it even wobbles as it spins and it's flying through an ever-expanding universe, then, then you just got to throw this out right here. But is that the only place God said it? No, it's not. So the earth is not moving. Here we go. First Chronicles 16.30. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. Now, now literally I heard Dr. Danny Faulkner of Answer in Genesis say, well, this just means like David when he said he, would, he wouldn't be moved. No, we're not talking about a man and his emotion or his religious beliefs and his stance. We're talking about the earth. He said, the earth is stable. He said, it can, that it be not moved. Psalm 93, 1, the Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he had girded himself. The world is established that it cannot be moved. Somebody say that. Cannot be moved. What does Satan come in? God said the world's still at rest, said it cannot be moved, and Satan comes in with a theory says it's spinning, flying, wobbling, moving. Yet Einstein admitted that there's no experiment that can be done to prove that the earth is moving. But yet he said, I still believe it's moving. Right? So Einstein knew you couldn't prove that the earth was moving. Now here's Psalm 104, 1 through 5. He says, blessed and affectionately praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. You are the one who covers yourself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a tent curtain. Here it is again. Multiple scriptures. The Bible says, let, 
by, every, let, by two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So here it is again. The world he stretched out like a tent to dwell in, who lays his beams in the upper chambers, in the waters above the firmament. That's actually exactly what the Amplified says. Who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks in the wings of the wind, who makes the winds his messenger, flames of fire his ministers. Those are angels, so those are literal things. He said, he established the earth on its foundation so that it will not be moved forever and ever. So see, I'm an earth is still guy. You then you got the earth is moving guy over here. It's pretty plain. Then it takes us to Job 38. So if you think we take verses out of context, Job 38, you can't, when, you, when you're talking about creation, God himself speaks to Job and the context of that conversation is the nature of God's creation. God himself speaking to Job. He said, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man, and I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where were you? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof are fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone? So the context of this verse... It's clear this passage is about creation. And God says he has foundations to the earth. Now, if you believe the spinning ball, heliocentric nonsense, you believe that we have an iron molten core that is, that is hotter than the sun, like 13,000 degrees, with liquid magma around it. And now they say there's even water around down in there somewhere. Does any of that sound like a foundation? or stable, or solid. No. No, in fact, they say that, the, the, here, here's their example. They say we have a lead nickel core. How many ever checked the, the melting point of lead and nickel? It's way lower than 13,000 degrees. But of course they'll say, well, it's because of pressure. It's always their little excuse to get out of something, but it's, it's crazy. God said he laid foundations of the earth. Let's keep reading. He literally said to sink them down just like you would. I used to be in construction. We used to have to dig deep foundations. And they were poured very specifically. So he talks about it. Now I need to speed on through here. You see it right there, to sink, press. Oh, like a seal too. He talks about the foundations. Now here's 1 Samuel 2, 8. And it says, he raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifted up the beggar from the dunghill and set them among princes to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Does that, does that, does the heliocentric Copernican model sound like he's setting something on pillars, on a foundation that's stable, not moving, still in at rest? I, I, I don't know yet. Know it. See, this is what happened to me. You talk about what happened in the beginning. I just started believing this. I didn't filter it anymore through the world's nonsense. Now we see the world is still in at rest and I mentioned a minute ago about the Michelson-Morley experiment. It says Michelson-Morley found the earth wasn't moving by using the speed of two light beams against one another. The null result was one of the greatest puzzles of physics at the end of the 19th century. He says the possibility was that there would be, the velocity would be zero and no fringe shift would be ex expected. But this implies that the earth is somehow a preferred object. So number one, they discovered that the earth is really the center, the preferred object of the whole creation. And then he says that it was not what moving. And of course it was, they did find one sixth movement of, again, only one sixth of what, it, what they said it was supposed to be moving, the speed it's supposed to be moving, they found one sixth. Well, that's the movement again of the ether current and I can't get into that. But here we go, let's go, let's get some, this, this, here's one of these documents. Now I'm gonna read, this is, this is one of these documents I dug up. This is, uh, let's see which one this is. Oh, there it is. The general equations of motion for a damaged asymmetric aircraft. Now what's interesting, this is point one and point two. I, I, this is one of my favorites because here in the introduction one, it says, in order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must reflect the underlying physics. Somebody say, must reflect the underlying physics. 
So if they're going to study damaged aircraft and how, it, how it, things happen to it in the sky, it says that the dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. In the next part, he says, this is just part two, that was in part one, he says, in this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating Earth are developed. Now, if in point one you say that studying this must reflect the true, proper, underlying physics, and the next thing you say all of our equations of motion are based on a flat, non-rotating Earth, how else, can you, how else can you read that? And if there's not a flat, non-rotating Earth, why would it be in here? Why would this unicorn be here? I'm talking about the fairy tale unicorns. Unicorns were real, by the way, but not the fairy tale unicorn. Y'all see that? Let's read it again. In order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. In this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating earth are developed. So here we have the Bible saying that the earth does not move, it's stable, it's at rest. We have the Michelson-Morley experiment proving the earth does not move that, that just blew up physics in the end of the 19th, uh, early 19th century there. And then, I mean, the late 19th century, and then we have a government document about how damaged aircraft work, and they admit that the, the, under, the proper underlying physics and equations are based on a non-rotating flat earth. That's three witnesses, y'all. Y'all hear me? That's the Bible, true scientists, and a technical manual about aircraft. Three witnesses. Now, I know some people love to pull this one out, so I'm going to deal with this. Oh, about the earth hanging on nothing. What is that talking about? Right? Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. Right? Here's what it is. The King James Version says, Hail is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. This is Job 26, 6 and 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now, the, the, the Copernicans, the, the ones that want to have this space, say, oh, see, 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 that's, that's space. That's, we're hanging on nothing. No, 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 my friend. You must dig a little deeper because the Hebrew words bear out what this means. And again, we have to take context. You can't take verse 7. You've got to take verse 6. So he's talking about hell or Sheol or the underworld, the underground. What do we know is in hell? We know there's, there's, there's different degrees of hell. And I'm not talking about Dante's degree, I'm talking about Bible degrees. But we, we know that we have different words and there's Tartarus for the deepest part of hell. And, and then we know that Satan is going to be bound when Jesus returns. Satan's going to be bound and placed in the, somebody say, bottomless pit. Which is in hell, which is the lowest part of hell. Okay? Now, what this here is saying, and let's go, the Amplified does it really well. But the Amplified Bible, and looking at the original Hebrew word, here, when it says he stretches out the north over the empty place where he hangs the earth upon nothing, when it says the word for upon clarifies this question about the earth allegedly hanging upon nothing, an empty place is the word tohu. Now, tohu in Hebrew, tohu vabohu was used in the creation when it says the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the deep. Well, if you look this word up, it means a desolation, destruction, chaos. And I, I can't get into all that right there. But he says that it's pronounced tohu, right, is chaos, wilderness, waste, confusion, a place of vanity or emptiness. The Hebrew word here upon is all, which can be translated above or over. And so in the Amplified, it says, Sheol, the place of the dead, is naked before God, and Abaddon, the place of destruction, has no covering for his eyes. It is he who spreads out the northern skies over the emptiness and hangs the earth over nothing. See, there is, this is what we believe. Nobody knows how deep the earth is. God said the heaven for height and the earth for depth, nobody would know. It's unsearchable, unknowable. The deepest hole ever dug is about eight miles. The Russians did it. We don't know anything beyond that. But at some point down there in hell, there is nothingness. There's a place of vanity and emptiness. There's a bottomless pit where Satan's going to be chained for a thousand years. And God stretched it out. And if you guys saw my Mountain of God in the North and Paradise series, some of you, if you haven't seen that, you need to watch it. You understand 
that God's throne is right above the North Star. The North Pole is right there. And where we're taught, the Bible shows us that it's really underneath. Underneath there is where paradise and hell starts, right there. So it makes sense. This verse makes sense when you know the truth of the shape of the earth and the nature of things. But taking this into context, it's not talking about hanging the earth in some empty space. It's talking about hanging the earth. Oh, the earth is just over this place of nothingness. So we deal with that. Now we get to Joshua. I'm just going to say, what do he say? Sun stand still upon Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed and the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun, here's the Bible says, so the sun stood still in the midst of heaven. That means it was, it was moving, not the earth. So Joshua here is teaching a completely different cosmology than the world and many of you have accepted. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And here's what's interesting. He said the sun was over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. Do you know what that means? The sun and the moon were over specific places that were pretty close to each other. It's amazing exactly east and west of each other. Look at here. There's Gibeon. There comes our moving sun. And there's our moon down over here in the valley of Ajalon. He could see them both. And what's interesting is that happens to us every now and then. In their circuits, they catch up with each other once in a while. And that's why you'll see the sun over here sometime in the sky and the moon right there by it. But Joshua knew exactly what areas of the earth they were over. And that's what the Bible says. Can we keep going? I can prove. Here we go. Let's, get, let's, let's go on. I got more illustrations. I'm going through them. The sun doesn't go down. We talked about that. It says to go or come. Now, there's Gibeon. There it is again. Goodness, I must have doubled up some slides here, Bryce. Here we go. We're getting through them. Of course, these crepuscular rays, these type of rays coming down shows the sun is not far away. I can't even get into that right now. All right. I've covered this. The Bible says the sun moves in a circuit to the ends of the earth. There's nothing hid from the heat thereof. There's your circuit means course or path. Here's the Hebrew word for circuit there. A revolution. That is the sun's course circuit. Here's another thing that's impossible in their model. And I'm trying to go quick, y'all, but it's, it's, it's a lot. The sun, he says here, Ecclesiastes, the sun arises, and that word arise just simply means it's not elevation. It means the rays begin to shoot forth when it, when it comes close to us. And then he says the sun goeth down. Again, that's the word bow. That just means to come and go. It doesn't mean to go up and down. And he says that the sun, though, hastes to his place where he arose. I mean, he goes back to the same place. How is that possible in a heliocentric universe? How can the sun, they say the sun's moving through this universe, just ever expanding. How can it ever return to the place it was before? Doesn't do it. Either the Bible's true or your, your, your secular heliocentric Copernican cosmology is true. They can't both be true. Here's an interesting document I found from one of Russia's top scientists that we stole from them during the Cold War. A.A. A. Orlov, his family was a highly awarded, decorated scientist in Russia. And we stole this from him, and this is in Declassified now. And he's talking about lunar solar disturbances in motion of artificial Earth satellites. And he says this here, it is assumed that the sun moves along a circle near the center of a planet satellite system of the masses. He says, an analysis is made of the motion of the satellites ca characterize any eccentricity, he says, an inclination of its orbit relation to the plane of the sun's motion. He says the sun's motion. He says the, he says the sun is moving in a circle. This is a Russian scientist in a top secret document. It says the sun is moving, has motion, and it moves in a circle. Isn't that amazing that God said in Psalm 19, the sun moves in a circle? Now, the shape of the earth. I know we're, hey, Pastor, you told me we could do it six hours, so I'm trying. Yeah. 
I'm trying, but I have to get it all in, all right? Now, this is the shape of the earth. Now, of course, everybody knows my book is entitled Like Clay Under the Seal from this, this verse in Job 38, 14. Now, I know he's going to try to attack that, so I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to just destroy any possible attack on it. Because, number one, the context of Job 38 is creation. Many Bible scholars, translators have translated that this is talking about the earth being or taking shape like clay under the seal. But I'm going to give you some other witnesses from Scripture that this is exactly how God made the earth or shaped the earth. But here's a few verses. We'll look at them. Here's the King James. It says, it is turned, talking about the earth, is turned. It's not talking about spinning because he said it means change. That, that Hebrew word means change like you would change a potato into mashed potatoes, right? Or like a person who was clean, the word is used when they got leprosy, it says they, their skin changed, okay? So it's not saying spinning. He says it's turned or changed as clay to the seal or the signet ring. And so clay was a glump of clay or seal and they would press it down with a signet ring, all right? So that gives you a flat surface with upturned edges there. Um, the complete Jewish Bible. Anybody think the Jews know how to translate their own Hebrew scriptures? I would think the Hebrews would know that no Hebrew would get us the Hebrew correct, okay? So here's the complete Jewish Bible. It says, then the earth is changed like clay under the seal. So they even got it in there. And then, of course, the Amplified Bible says, the earth is changed like clay into which the seal is pressed. The NIV says the earth is take shape like clay under the seal. So there you have all these several different translations and you have the, the definition of the words which I could go into. Now here's the verses that confirm this because the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. Amen? So this idea of the earth taking shape like clay under a signet ring or seal being pressed down flat this image is also what we get in other verses about creation, but you have to look up the Hebrew words. I'm going to give it to you here. So Isaiah 42.5 says this, Thus saith God, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, that created the heavens and stretched them out. Notice it says, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. When he says he that spread it out, just remember that. He spread forth the earth. Another scripture, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the wound, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth. Again, he says that term. Now notice it says by myself. I'm going to show you a mistake that King James makes here. He says, who stretches out the earth by himself. Do you know I can read a little Hebrew? And you know what? And I've got my Hebrew scholar here, one of them, our Dr. John Strazic, to get it right there. PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary, he'll tell you this too. This right here, when it says he spreadeth abroad the earth in Isaiah 44, by myself, is not in the original. It's et ma'im in Hebrew. Et ma'im means upon or in relation to the waters. Ma'im is the waters of creation. So he's saying that he spread the earth in relation to the waters, just like he says in Genesis 1. Let's keep going. He says, and then there's Psalm 136.6. It says, to him that stretches out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. So let's look at this term, spreadeth out. Because three times here, he says he spreads out the earth, meaning telling you this is how I did it. Like if a woman's rolling out some dough, she says, I spread out the dough. But how does she do it, Right? He's going to tell you how he did it. Right here is the word. It's that word again, raka, where we get the word rakia from. But the word raka, the verb, where he spread out the earth, this is what it means. Look at this. Brown driver, Briggs lexicon, also the strongs. Beat, somebody say, stamp. Yeah. Spread out. Spread out. Press down. Y'all see it? Stamp. Stamp is just another term for, guess what? A seal. But he uses the term stamped, pressed down. So literally you could read those verses. If you back up to those verses, that he stamped forth the earth, that he pressed it down. 
This is the same picture. So three times you have this. There it is. To beat, to stamp, to beat out, to spread out. Guess what? You can buy these. They're called stamp kits. You see it? Go ahead and put it back up there. Stamp. What's the definition of stamp? Bring down one's foot upon heavily on the ground or on something on the ground. He stamped his foot in frustration. Impress a pattern or mark. Wax stamp kit. There it is right there. That's what the word stamp means. So we have those verses. Now I'm going to end, I'll, I, well, hopefully we'll end on this. But here, here's, if you want confirmation from the New Testament, I was getting prepared to do a, mer a message on the marriage supper of the Lamb. I wasn't even studying creation or cosmology. And I was reading this, and I've read it many times out of the King James words. It says, when the thousand years were expired, this is Revelation 27 through 9. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and she'll go, he shall go out to see the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and they compassed the camp of the saints about, and the blood city, and fire came down from God from heaven and devoured them. So this is talking about the last rebellion after the 1,000-year millennial reign. Now notice he uses the term the breadth of the earth here. Now... Now, it's what hit me. The Holy Spirit hit me. And I'm reading this, and I'm like, he could have just said that they came out upon the earth. No need to put the breadth of the earth there, right? It's actually like an added word. I'm like, why is that even there? And I'd never looked it up. In all my 36 years of studying the Bible, I never looked it up. So I looked it up. Start looking up these Hebrew and Greek words. It gets dangerous because the word breadth here is the word plateaus. Sound familiar? Plateaus. What are plateaus? They're a flat land, right? Well, the word, the root, and then notice in, in your Greek dictionary, you're gonna, it's going to lead you down the root words. And it says, the word here is plateaus, which means width or breadth. Plateaus, we know what it means. He says, it's from, though, 4116 in your Greek dictionary. So let's go to 4116, which is the, well, the root word plateaus. Plateaus. What does plateaus mean in the Strong's Greek Dictionary? To spread out flat. So literally the verse in Revelation 20 says they went up upon the flat earth. That's the definition of the words in the original language. Here's where it gets even crazy. Notice it says that, that plateaus has a root word. Plateaus says it comes from 4111. Right? So let's go to 4111 and see what it says. Here's the, the, the word 411. Here's the word in Greek. Listen to what it means here. Plasso to form, mold something from clay or wax. Literally, the potter fabricates or shapes something from clay or wax that's flat. That's that word, the breadth of the earth. This is why you have to study the Bible deeper than many of us have over the years. We lose so much understanding when we don't go back to the original Hebrew and Greek, and even sometimes to the verb tenses of the the Greek language. And there they're all three together. And I'm going to just end with this part. I'm not going to show you, but there have been two astronauts that were interviewed. One, the general, highly decorated Mishla Hermaneski, who recently died. He was the only Polish cosmonaut for the Soviet Union. He was asked in an interview right here, you've been there is the earth really a sphere, a sphere hanging in outer space? And his answer was, the earth is flat, as some may expect. I didn't expect this question. I assure you it's flat. And there was another Russian cosmonaut who was awarded to be the hero of the Soviet Union. He said, we haven't been to space. If someone claims that we have been, it's not true. It's not the truth. 
These are two astronauts. I believe in the days ahead, these are whistleblowers. I believe in the days ahead, we're going to have more whistleblowers that come out and tell the truth. Well, folks, I have given you the witness of Scripture, the witness of scientists, astronauts, but even those don't matter. The Word of God is clear. God made the earth still and it rests immovable, stable, upon pillars, upon a foundation. And in God's creation, there is an up and a down. Jesus ascended up. Where is that? Where is up for the poor Australians? Heaven is up. Hell is down. That is a simple concept. Doesn't work on a spinning water ball. All right? But God said he made the earth with a firmament over it, and it's a solid, crystalline, molten glass dome. And his throne sits upon it. And he says over and over, the earth is shaped like clay under a seal. It's the breadth of the earth, the flat earth. It's motionless. This is what God describes in the scriptures, and this is why many atheists have got saved when they've seen the evidence. So I rest my case. God bless you.